Hey everybody, <laughs> everybody, uh, welcome to TMI Live number 60, 1960. Um, it's Tuesday night, it's 9 p.m. Here I am in the library of Eric McLuhan, which we uh, refer to lovingly as the scriptorium. Uh, <laughs> my friend S. Alfonso Williams is in the house as ever. Hey man. Uh, yeah, wow, 60, TMI Live number 60, it's kind of crazy. I think I've been doing this about like two years or so, so not quite every week. Uh, I was thinking about it earlier when I'm trying to think of what I'm going to actually talk about because um, it's kind of, <laughs> I, I never seem to run out of things to say, but it is often a bit of a challenge to think of what to talk about. When I first started this, um, my idea was to bring you along uh, as I'm cataloging Eric McLuhan's library. Of course, since I started, um, my wife and I and our boys moved here. Uh, so uh, the pressure is a little bit off from doing the inventory of Eric McLuhan's library, um, which is a good thing, but also, uh, you know, means that my energies go elsewhere and the inventory part of things is a little set aside for the moment anyway. Um, when thinking about what to do, uh, for tonight's live thing, um, I saw it was number 60 and I thought 1960. Um, so I thought I would uh, talk a little bit about uh, the archive here at the McLuhan Institute. This is something my dad started to put together um, and it's a, a couple of filing cabinets in the back, down in the back there. Um, year by year of the writings, uh, materials of Marsh McLuhan and it's not complete. Um, but it's organized year by year, and uh, I thought I would uh, give us all a spin through uh, 1960. Um, just to give you an idea, it's a really interesting thing to, um, to look at uh, anybody's work, I suppose, year by year. Um, it's a different way of looking at it. To, to pick a, a file folder uh, of a year from the work life of Marshall McLuhan is an interesting thing. Um, 1960 is a good example because it's um, it's before he was world famous, but not before he was very well known. Um, by 1960, Marshall McLuhan was very well known um, as an academic, as an expert on uh, modernist poetry, uh, as a, a English literature professor, but also more and more um, uh, on communications. Uh, remember that the Explorations Group uh, Culture and Communication Seminar started in the early 1950s. So Marshall had been going uh, on for quite a while. Um, the first item in here is called The Gutenberg Galaxy, A Voyage Between Two Worlds. Um, and The Gutenberg Galaxy was published uh, in 1962, but Marshall was already working on it in 1960. Um, I didn't really take the time to review this beforehand. Uh, I thought I'd, I'd bring you with me. Um, it says the Gutenberg Galaxy, a voyage between two worlds with Marshall McLuhan for the National Association of Educational Broadcasters and Harley Parker from the Royal Ontario Museum and Robert Schaefer, Associate Professor of Education at Wayne State University. Um, Marshall here is representing the NAEB, um, who had hired him to develop a syllabus for high school education. Uh, he would deliver something called the Report on the Project in Understanding New Media, um, which four years later would be published as Understanding Media, uh, The Extensions of Man. So this is uh, a, a transcript. Um, it starts with an open statement by Marshall. Uh, today, the globe has shrunk in the wash with speeded up information movement from all directions. We have come, as it were, to live in a global village. Our information comes at high speed, electronic speed, from all quarters. We would seem to be living almost under ear conditions off a small village world. I'm Marsha McLuhan. With me, uh, Robert Schaefer and Harley Parker are going to attempt a voyage through the recent centuries, five centuries, of Gutenberg culture, the Gutenberg galaxy. Um, so 
also, uh, and what follows is, is a transcript, which is 20, just about 20 pages. Uh, and I could spend uh, <laughs> quite a long time reading this to you, but I just wanted to give you a survey. So there's one item. Uh, next up, and I'm not sure if this is actually um, the total output of 1960, but this is what we have in the file. Um, next up is from, uh, well, it's an article by Marshall McLuhan called Grammars for the Newer Media. Marshall McLuhan, Professor of English, St. Michael's College, University of Toronto. Um, and it opens, when I began to teach freshman rhetoric in 1936, the, quote, new criticism, unquote, had not yet begun to be current in colleges, nor had there yet begun that full study of ancient rhetoric as a means of understanding Renaissance literature. Moreover, the application of anthropological method to the appreciation of the multi-leveled riches in popular culture had not yet come into vogue. From the first, I used all three of these approaches to freshman English and further found the basic English of Ogden and Richards a wonderful aid. To these, I would add today an introduction to the, quote, languages of the various media of writing, typing, print, photography, film, radio, and television. For these tongues of the media, whether touched with mechanism or electronic fire, serve to reshape the patterns of discourse and constitute a large portion of our, quote, unquote, meaning. Uh, there follows uh, another article. You begin to see why it's possible to lose yourself uh, in this place for hours and hours and hours because you just want to keep reading. But um, I'm just giving a survey. Hopefully uh, I'll be able to open this place uh, so people can come visit here and study these materials and maybe even possibly put them all up online eventually, but copyright issues and everything prevent me at this time. Um, next is uh, from... Uh, volume called Myth and Mythmaking, edited by Henry A. Murray, 1960. Uh, Marshall is chapter 16, Myth and Mass Media. I guess I'll just read the first paragraphs of these things. Uh, oh, thanks for the hearts. Hey, Chris uh, and Kevin Cole. Chris, long time. Hope you're well. Uh, Myth and Mass Media, Marshall McLuhan. When an attempt is made to bring the relatively articulated concept of, quote, myth into the area of, quote, media, a concept to which surprisingly little attention has been given in the past, it is necessary to reconsider both myth and media in order to get at relevant data. For example, English is itself a mass medium, as is any language employed by any society. But general use of the phrase mass media would seem to record an unfavorable valuation of new media, especially since the advent of the telegraph, the telephone, moving pictures, radio, and television. These media have had the same kind of drastic effect on language and culture that print had in Europe in the 16th century, or that it is now having in other parts of the world. Marshall is saying stuff that we take for granted today, you know, language is a mass medium, but um, that was not common uh, back in there. Oh, there's an underlining here later. Another way of getting at this aspect of languages as macro myths is to say that the medium is the message. I'll have to come back and put this uh, in my file. I'm collecting all these quotes of Marshall saying the medium is the message. Uh, next. Oh, good. So, um, Marshall was a professor of English. Uh, he was still heavily involved in the English lit game. Um, one thing he did a lot of, he read a lot, as you know, if you've been watching these things, um, he read a lot, uh, and, uh, he wrote a lot of reviews. Um, there are a few in this file. He was still writing reviews in 1960. He eventually uh, fell away from it, not having the time to do that, but here he has uh, a review. <clears throat> a Critical Discipline, Wyndham Lewis, A Portrait of the Artist as the Enemy by Jeffrey Wagner, Wagner, Yale University Press, 1958, $5. Um, Marshall, of course, a big fan of Wyndham Lewis, 
uh, I would say friend, but friend maybe isn't the word for somebody who knew Lewis. Um, Marshall here is reviewing a book about uh, Lewis uh, and he starts <clears throat> And by the way, this is signed H. Marshall McLuhan. Marshall still used the H. His first name is Herbert um, when doing reviews and things like that. Very literary. It opens quite apart from the spiteful tone and attitude of the author. This is a valuable book. <laughs> Wagner's reactions toward his subject are so entirely typical of the literate contemporaries of Lewis that he has, as it were, drawn a portrait of himself as the indignant indignant enemy of the enemy, but in his dedication to the task of eliminating the great Lewis from the literary scene, he at least reveals the huge dimensions of the ogre at Bloom of Bloomsbury. Anyone who has had the good luck to stumble on time in Western man, or the art of being ruled in his undergraduate days, will get a conducted tour of the 20th century world of power and human manipulation such as was reserved even in the 18th century for the very few. Um, and it goes on, this was printed in Renaissance, uh, a journal of critical letters, 1960, volume 12, number two. Marshall contributed quite a lot to um, Renaissance, that journal. Uh, there was a special issue of Renaissance some years ago, um, <clears throat> which printed a lot of his things, Chris is saying, uh, Northrop Fry wrote Anatomy of Criticism in the 50s. He once said he had wished he had never written the book. Well, I can't see the rest, uh, Chris. I'll have to look at that later. Northrop Fry and McLuhan were colleagues uh, at the university. <clears throat> uh, and not the enemies that uh, people take them to be, I don't think. I think it was more of a, a friendly kind of rivalry that was certainly respectful. Northrop Fry, by the way, Speaking of 1960, um, in 1962, when the Gutenberg Galaxy, the making of typo typographic man, was published, um, Northrop Fry was on the committee that awarded Marshall um, the Governor General's Award for nonfiction for that book. So um, it was uh, it was a respectful relationship, even though they were a little bit at odds with certain things, different schools of criticism. Uh, here we have Renaissance again, volume 12, number four, summer 1960. And H. Marshall McLuhan with... <clears throat> oh, where is it, Marshall? The Image Industries. Sorry, one second. Rudolf Morris. Sure. Oh, here it is. Around the World, Around the Clock. The Image Industries by William Lynch, S.J., a Jesuit, Sheed and Ward, $3.50. Uh, and Marshall opens. Father Lynch has been led by true wisdom in devoting recent years to an intensive study of contemporary aesthetic problems. This study has also taught him to see the relevance of the art forms of the new electric media. As he has meditated upon the new forces in our culture, he has encountered the Maginot, sorry, I know I'm pronouncing that line, Maginot <laughs> line of official culture. Quote, this surely means an increasing group of intellectuals and generally competent people must give up what I cannot but interpret as a form of snobbishness in the face of the problems of popular culture and the mass media. Dot, dot, dot. In my own visits to some dozen colleges and universities, Catholic and non-Catholic, I wish I had been able to detect any positive enthusiasm among them in the interests of this great national task." Unquote. Um, a lot of Marshall's reviews, um, and this is why they're one reason why they're useful and, and worth looking at. Um, incidentally, uh, the interior landscape, the literary criticism of Marshall McLuhan contains a lot of these reviews and was published in the late 1960s. Um, it's worth looking at. If you want a copy, go to the McLuhaninstitute.com where I have a shop and I will sell you one. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, they're, they're interesting reviews because they were a way for Marshall to review the book, get a review copy of the book, review the book, but then, uh, you know, put out his own thoughts and, uh, ideas and views, 
uh, in between the lines, the line share of the work. Um, what is this? Here we go. Another review commentary uh, edited by Norman Podhoretz, July 1960, volume 30, number one, commentary. It's another thing looking through these old files to see all these journals and uh, review magazines that are no longer around, that I know of anyway. Uh, commentary is published monthly by the American Jewish Committee, apparently. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, American Folklore by Richard M. Dorson. Uh, title, Myth, Oral and Written. American Folklore by Richard M. Dorson, University of Chicago Press, 450. Uh, he opens with a quote. Since the arc of tradition in a given culture may vary considerably from country to country, it is only right that the study of folklore should follow the contours of a particular civilization. The scientific folklorist seeks out, observes, collects, and describes the inherited traditions of the community whatsoever forms they take." Unquote. Such is Professor Dorson's undertaking, and it is a broad program which has my own sympathies and interests deeply involved. Yet such a program might easily parallel Lewis Carroll's idea of a map of the scale of one mile to the mile. Carroll pointed out that since such a map would inevitably, inevitably rouse the hostility of farmers, we might alternatively use the earth itself as a map of itself. And is it not what, and is not this what folklorists have hit upon as a strategy of culture, with the ordinary citizen in the role of the farmer about to be blanketed by an earth map? If so, can we find some means of awareness that will not obliterate the cultural scene, some way to get enough light through and still prevent a general brainwashing by putting too much light on? Light on, light through was um, something Marshall was very interested in at the time, actually throughout, um, and it was one of his categories of media, um, the screen. Uh, where light comes through versus the page where light comes on or is reflected versus refracted. Uh, here's Renaissance again, volume 13, number one, autumn 1960, with H. Marshall McLuhan, Shakespeare and Company. Uh, the Personal Approach, Shakespeare and Company by Sylvia Beach, Harcourt Brace, 450. Marshall says, this book is a document which makes available to readers the artistic excitement and dedication felt by many people in the 1920s. It is a record of the oral and social lives of some of those directly involved in the production of some of the greatest poetry and painting and music of this century. Um, yeah, I've read this one before. I'm pretty sure this one is in uh, uh, the book, The Literary Criticisms of Marshall McLuhan, um, and it's a cool one. He, he ends it, many people now living could not be better engaged than in emulating Miss Beach in recording their direct personal acquaintance with various artists of our time. There ought to be a magazine called Anna Log as an outlet for the epiphanizing anecdote, suggests Marshall. Um, next we have, uh, oh, this is a reprint of something of this. Um, from the Journal of Economic History, December 1960. Um, and it is titled... Exciting stuff here. Oh, my mom's watching. Hey, mom. <laughs> uh, it's titled Effects of the Improvements of Communication Media. This is a rather... It's a fairly lengthy article. 575. Uh, the advantage of having a tightly woven thesis to present to you is that it can be used in the introductory paper as a rug to be yanked violently from under my feet. If caution leads Professor Easterbrook, quote, to remain at least for the time being in the informational camp, unquote, it is obvious that only a total absence of caution would lead me, a professor of English, to venture before the leaders in the field of economic history in the role aside to me today. I'll read the next one too. 
I stand open to the rebuff described in the story of the two goats. <laughs> That's funny, I actually use this anecdote later because it's fun. I stand open to the rebuff described in the story of the two goats who were feasting on a junk heap behind a Hollywood studio. One of them, having come upon an old print of the film of Gone with the Wind, was chomping enthusiastically. He signaled to his companion to come on over and sample his find. The other goat did so and chewed meditatively for a bit when the first one said, how did you like it? And the second one said, as a matter of fact, I like the book better. Boom. Just which of these is the media goat in which the information goat admits, as Sir Thomas Brown put it, of a wide solution? Um, so this was, this is probably the transcript or uh, a essay from a speech that Marshall gave because he always opened with jokes and kept them coming if he was losing people. Uh, just a few things left here. There's, um, as happens in these files, there's some just random sheets of paper, which I don't know uh, where they're from, but uh, I think they're from the archives, Canadian archives, and uh, they're probably dictated notes. So just point forms. Mass culture under under the title mass media, mass media hypotheses. Mass culture is electric, the telegraph and after. Popular culture was and is derivative from print and the, from the mechanisms of production and marketing based on the assembly lines of movable type. This is 1960, remember. Mass media are producer-oriented, like tribal societies, empathic, with it. They include the consumer or public in themselves as process and do not address the public. Mass media, since the telegraph, do not speak to a public but through the public. The TV image merely makes this fact more obvious. The empathic dimension, which constitutes a mass medium and a mass culture, is simultaneity. All at onceness is resonating inclusiveness of all components and all levels, as in spoken but not written language. In the West, written, print, and mechanical cultures are based on the one-thing-at-a-time technology of the phonetic alphabet. This technology and its heritage are at odds with electricity. Media technology is an abstraction and an extension of one or another of our senses. Today, our total sensorium is externalized. In the West, the business of art has long been to the assimilation of technological change in order to correct the distortion of our senses created by new technology. Under electric conditions, the artist becomes the only available social navigator. His alienation from society is ended. The content of any medium is another medium. The understanding of media as art forms is achieved by translation of one medium into another. Uh, and there's a few more pages. And finally, uh, we have a magazine forum. Uh, University of Houston, summer 1960. I think I've actually shared this on the Marshall McLuhan Facebook before. <clears throat> this, um, this is a pretty cool edition. Donald Barthelm, editor, uh, published quarterly by the University of Houston. This is volume three, number four, 1960. Um, and it's got some heavy hitters in here, uh, including Hugh Kenner. Uh, with a piece on Beckett, uh, Walk, Walker Percy, Carnival and Gentilly, um, etc. Uh, Peter Yates with a portrait of Gertrude Stein and Marshall McLuhan on page 19. Remember, this is 1960 with an article titled The Medium is the Message. Um, so many people, when you find The Medium is the Message quoting, quoted, People often say 1964, uh, and again, this is 1960, and he actually first said it in 1958 and was saying it frequently thereafter. Um, I'll read the first paragraph. It is not easy to convince a literary man that an interest in the psychodynamics of the printed form of codification of information is anything but malice toward literature. Moreover, he is likely to feel personal humiliation 
at finding that he is, in fact, quite unaware of some of the basic effects of the print form upon many of his most cherished ideas and attitudes. If I explain that radio and television are not really consumer media in the full sense that photography and film are, Madison Avenue gets upset. Personally, I am not trying to upset such people. I am really trying to understand media and to discover their unique dynamics. And he goes on. That's a, a pretty heavy paragraph. It's really interesting, at least for me, to look at his writing style change and where he uh, speaks like this in 1960 versus how uh, in the first chapter of Understanding Media he goes about explaining the medium is the message. Anyway, that's a, a spin through 1960 in the work of Marsha McLuhan. Uh, thanks for being here. If you're interested, speaking of Understanding Media, I am again starting uh, the second part of my deep dive into understanding media, looking at chapters 8 through 20. Uh, it begins this Saturday through grayarea.org. Check it out. Uh, oh, Kevin Cole says, regarding the new criticism of I.A. Richards, this was partially an attempt to reintroduce the curricular trivium into America. Yeah, well, that's uh, a subject for another time. Um, thanks for being here. Take care of each other and yourselves. Good night.